Hi, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kirsten Vandetta. I am a senior product manager at LinkedIn, and I'm excited to talk to you today about two of my favorite topics, uh, user empathy and enterprise products. So a little bit about me before we get started. Uh, I've been in product for about seven years now. I started at a company called SimpleView, uh, which creates technology for um, destination management organizations and travel and tourism. And they were a startup and I did that for a few years before moving into um, higher education. So I worked with a great team at the University of Arizona to modernize the student experience and really create digital tools on campus. And now I'm at LinkedIn, which is a larger firm uh, and working specifically with building technology for sales as a senior product manager. And most of my B2C experience really was in higher education. And so a lot of my experience across from SimpleView to LinkedIn is in the enterprise space. So when we talk about user empathy today, that applies for regardless of what product you're in. Um, but when we talk about empathy in action, uh, I will sprinkle some flavor on that uh, when it comes to enterprise products. So the first section we'll talk about create, how to create a culture of empathy. Um, not only within yourself, but how you build that with your team and even up to leadership. And then when we talk about empathy in action, we'll talk about how empathy is not just listening and understanding, it's also doing. Um, and so what can we do to prioritize our user needs in enterprise products? And then the last thing, just uh, we'll talk about the effects of empathy, uh, especially as you're building empathy within your team. Uh, in fact, there was an article recently that came out in Forbes, and it was talking about Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, and how he says there's one psychological trait um, of the most innovative teams, and that turns out to be empathy. And so empathy can really create innovation by truly understanding your users and putting yourself in their shoes. So that's what we'll talk about. So let's start with creating a culture of empathy. Well, first, what is empathy? What is user empathy? User empathy is understanding something from your user's point of view, from their perspective, not yours. So if you're listening to someone, they're telling you a story about something and you're putting it in your own frame of reference, um, that is not empathy. Empathy would be listening to someone and actually putting yourself in their shoes, why they may feel the way they do, you know, their goals, why are their goals that way? What do they need to do to accomplish their goals? What are their pain points? What are the struggles that they're dealing with? And understanding them coming from a perspective of understanding them instead of judging them. Um, and so that is user empathy, um, walking a mile in someone else's shoes, really. So how do we build empathy for ourselves, for our teams? Well, I'll start with just in general, how you can be empathetic. And then we'll talk about how to build empathy in our teams and then with our leadership teams and our internal stakeholders uh, for our users specifically. So first thing, listen, listen, listen. Um, if you're not listening and you're doing more talking than they are, you're going to miss something about their pain points, their motivations and anything you need in order for you to truly understand what problems need to be solved. Because at the end of the day, product is about finding the right problems to solve right? And really understanding those problems. Um, another thing, I just put this as a, a sub bullet. I think it's really important to allow for silence. When you are being empathetic and you're really trying to understand someone, if you are not prepared to sit in some silence while they process and you process, you might miss something. And our knee-jerk reaction might be to fill the silence with our own perspective. So an example of that might be if somebody says, well, it's really frustrating for me because X. And you say, can you tell me a little bit more about that? And they pause and you, you know, maybe you're counting like 10 seconds, 15 seconds. I mean, that's a long time, actually. <laughs> you're just sitting in silence. Um, and then you respond with, is it because? Would it help if? Now you've switched roles. Now you're talking about your perspective. You're truly trying to be helpful but you're not listening to them anymore. You've now put yourself in the situation and it's not about you, right? So uh, allow for that silence, you know, if it's too long, you know, maybe not 20 seconds, you know, jump in there, but allow for that. And during those silent moments, process, put yourself in their shoes, you know, instead of 
thinking to yourself, well, why wouldn't they just do it this way? Think, okay, so if I was them, I'm doing it this way because, and that leads you to better questions, to be more curious and ask the right questions. And again, don't ask those with prompts. Would it work better if, and definitely don't solution when you're being, when you're just being an empathetic ear, definitely don't solution. You're still listening to them and it's still about them and not what you can do for them yet. The next thing is speak their language. So it's really easy. We're all, you know, we're as product managers, we work with engineering, we work with UX, we work with leadership, we work in the industry, and there's a lot of jargon floating around. Leave your jargon at the door. Unless it's jargon that your users use, don't use it. Use their jargon, learn their industry terms, work to understand where they're coming from and use words that they identify with versus what you identify with. The last two kind of go together, um, using empathetic language and avoiding judgmental language. And in order to avoid judgmental language, you have to avoid thinking judgmentally. So let's, let's do an example of what that might look like. So we have a user who says, I would like to accomplish task X in fewer steps. It's super frustrating, too many clicks. Okay, so a judgmental language and judgment looks like well, that doesn't, you know, why? I mean, it's not that hard. Just a few clicks, then they're done. So that's pretty common, probably in any product, forget enterprise, right? Like that's pretty common in any product. And where that judgmental language comes in, you've lost your empathy. You've already decided they're lazy. It's not that much. And they're being sort of whiny. So your judgmental language is nowhere close to empathetic. (laughs) Empathetic language flips the script and we think to ourselves, I wonder why it's frustrating for them. How many clicks is it? What are they trying to accomplish? Could they do it, you know, I guess not could they do it a different way, but, you know, how frequent are they doing that? Because that would be really frustrating if they're doing like, you know, this many times a day. You know, we could look at that. Now you're using empathetic language. I understand that that is frustrating. I could see how that would be frustrating, especially if it's this many times. So the difference is judgy, not judgy, right? But the difference is you're really trying to put yourself in their shoes. Even when your knee jerk reaction might be that is ridiculous. It seriously is a couple clicks. (laughs) We have other things to deal with. Um, And that can be helpful, especially if you're in a setting with your users where you're talking to them, you know, not having that judgy language where they come with something to you and you immediately solution for them and basically tell them like, they're doing it all wrong. You can do it this way. Everybody else is. Another way to build empathy within your team is with your personas and your user stories. Now personas, I'm going to say broadly, lots of people build personas depending on the size of the company you're in and what roles you have in your product team. So if you're in a large company, it might be UX that builds personas. It could even be product marketing. Um, If you're in a smaller company, it could be you uh, as the product manager. Regardless of where those come from, use them as much as you can because it puts a face to a name and a role. The second thing is, is using user stories as a way to build in that empathetic language. So not just you and anyone you're talking to is, is taking in those stories from the user perspective, but you're getting that into anything anybody's reading, you know, engineering is going to read it, Scrum Master is going to read it, everybody that's working in Jira basically is going to read it, or your spreadsheet or whatever you're using. So our example is on the left, we have Faceless Dude uh, who wants to export data because he's going to manipulate some data offline for monthly reports. Well, your knee-jerk reaction probably is, no, stop exporting stuff. What do you need in the reporting tool? But skip that. Um, on the other side, we have as a data analyst, so we have a we have a persona. I need to apply custom calculations, monthly board reports. We need this because we we should exist to our board um, and our community so we can keep our funding. The difference is no persona versus a persona. I have a generalized why and nothing for my engineering team to even tie themselves to. They, there's nothing for them to connect to. Why are they taking data out of the system? We have a reporting tool. Um, whereas the other one, they can empathize. They kind of see what's happening. Okay, monthly board reports, you know, 
the solution's not anywhere in here. It's just, I have something to connect to. I have someone to connect it to. And clearly the product manager has done a little more investigation too, if I know enough to put that much detail in there. So that helps using your empathetic language in your user stories. The second thing, actually, I don't know what number one, but the next thing is that sharing user feedback with your team is super important. You can also share it with leadership. You can share it up. You can share it out. But definitely with your team, specifically UX and engineering, I feel like get forgotten a lot. And I speak from experience. So when you get positive feedback, something, whether it's from a stakeholder, a buyer, a user, whatever that might be, share it, share it, share it, share it. They built it. They're building the tool. They're maintaining the solution. They were the ones that, that really innovated and tried to think of the solution along with your expert problem definition and your why. Um, but it helps them connect with users more. Let's say they worked with your product champions or your user group or something. And now that it's rolled out and users are using it and they're blown away. I mean, man, you know, for your engineering team to be able to say, oh my gosh, we worked with Julie on that. And she loves it. Like, this is so cool. On the reverse side, don't protect your team from negative feedback. Now I put a, like a tiny caveat on that in that we want to share. We want to make sure our teams are hearing what's important to our users. But if you get something that's just like, you know, really negative language, um, make sure that when you forward that on, that you are adding narrative somehow to say what the negative impact is versus the negative language. Ignore the negative language and look deeper again in their shoes. What is the actual pain point and problem they're bringing up? And that can really help your team connect to your users, both positive and negative. So you got to share the negative feedback. It's how you get to the positive feedback. The next thing is actually four things. These are not small things. So it's kind of funny that I put them all in one slide. So you'll see a little disclaimer at the bottom. Once you get these slides, if you want to download them, you're welcome to read that. Um, but basically these are really big things. They take a lot of management time um, from you, uh, from whoever else on your team might be helping with these, but they are invaluable um, ways to create feedback loops and connect your team to your users in order to build that empathy. So the first one's a user advisory group, call it whatever you want, a user group, a focus, well, it's not a focus group, um, uh, but are really a group of maybe product champions or product users that you get together and they partner with you on really digging in with how they work and what they need and what their goals are and bring your team to meetings with this group. Make sure your team is embedded in these conversations your team, UX, um, engineering, whoever else is on your team, they're going to hear different things than you do in those meetings. And you all coming out of those meetings with those different perspectives gives you just such a leg up when you go to create solutions. Yeah, I mean, you can be really innovative because you truly understand um, what's going on with your users. The next thing is um, sprint demos. I put sprint slash feature demos, but it's really sprint demos. So if you have, this probably works better with a smaller company, um, but if you have, uh, say your user group or your user advisory group, or you have some product champions that are helping you with building a specific feature set, invite them to the sprint reviews where your team is demoing what they've built. Because not only does it help them give immediate feedback, but you start to build empathy both ways. They see all the effort your team is putting in. They see how the progress is coming along and they can give you feedback, but also understanding where you're coming from. And then also engineering can hear immediately like, oh, I, I thought that was going to include this or, oh my gosh, I can't even, oh, we asked for this and you gave us this and this is amazing and I can't wait to use it. It was really a really important piece um, I found in, in uh, connecting my team to users. And we got that idea from a fabulous Agile coach. So if he watches this, I hope he knows who he is. Uh, for feedback sessions, um, what I mean by that is really, I mean, it really is a focus group, but invite your team to those. And so you're probably thinking right now, like, wow, that sounds like a lot of meetings, Kirsten, and engineering is kind of busy. 
Um, you know, we only have so many resources. Pool, calling your engineers resources, first of all, is not empathetic. <laughs> so your engineers are not resources. They can be resources to accounting and finance. To you, they're your team. And yes, you want to honor their time. You want them to be able to do the work that they need to do, but they're going to do better work if they connect with users. So it doesn't have to be a weekly thing, a daily thing, whatever, have them come quarterly even, but give them that time to connect, ask the questions that they have. It makes you guys all work together in the same way, coming from the same perspective, or sorry, bringing your different perspectives to build this just really excellent, massive transformer. <laughs> Um, and then the last thing is surveys. Surveys are a science. Be careful with surveys. Those can be built wrong. They can be interpreted wrong. Make sure you and keep those. Um, in fact, maybe hire someone to help you build your surveys first to start. Um, but surveys don't have to be long either. They can be short. They can be in application. They can be for a specific feature. Um, but surveys give you the quantitative data in some cases. So you'll get your analytics from your product. You'll look at your usage, your daily active users, whatever that might be. And your surveys help sprinkle a little more qualitative on top of that as well. So quick breath here um, before we move into the next section. I just want to do a quick check. Empathy is so important. Um, like Satya said, it's important for innovation. It's important for really understanding your users, but it is a method of understanding and connecting. It is not a method of agreeing with or committing to. You can put yourself in the shoes of somebody who, you know, has opposing views than you without agreeing with their opposing views, right? To be empathetic is to understand from someone else's perspective. So I just want to make sure everybody knows in no way, shape, or form am I saying go through all of your backlog, be super sad about all the clicks, have lots of sympathy for your users, and make sure everything that they're bummed about gets on the roadmap. That's sympathy. Empathizing is understanding, and you can empathize without putting it on the roadmap. So our next thing is how do we build user empathy with leadership and our internal stakeholders? Now, some of our internal stakeholders might interact with users a lot. For example, the sales team or the support team, they interact with users a lot. So they're going to have a lot of user empathy already, but leadership might not. And the, and the users that leadership is interacting with might actually be more like buyers and stakeholders. And so that connection is missing and you are the missing link. So how do you do that? How do you build user empathy? How do you go into a conversation and say, yes, CEO or VP of product or whatever that might be, you know, that sounds like a great idea, that solution and that initiative. Um, but here's what I could say about these last few meetings we've had with the user group. Here are the problems that they're up against. Here's how we could we think we could solve that, yada, yada, yada. And here's the impact to us. And it really helps when you bring empathetic language the whys, the background, the impact, and kind of put a face to a name. Um, so four, four things here, and actually the last one, telling a compelling story is just a given. It's down all of them. But the first one is having a roadmap that outlines your problems that you're solving and not your features that you're building. Not all of us have the luxury of doing that. It's really hard for people to move to a bar on your roadmap that says um, reduce manual data entry or save users time with blah, 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 right? Um, it can be kind of tough because people want something a little more tangible. And so we end up with feature roadmaps. They're not perfect. We end up with them, but if you can move, if you can move your roadmap to problems to solve versus features to build, you get away from a lot of things like, you know, not having conversations about why that one feature isn't out yet. You know, you get to leave your engineering team room to actually innovate and create solutions without pigeonholing them already on the roadmap and not leaving them a lot of room to change. Um, the next thing is communicating user impact and value often, often, often. So everything that you had in your user stories, make sure when you're having meetings, you're talking about the whys, you're putting, you're sharing user feedback, you're making your users real 
and from their perspective. You are them in all of your meetings. You are the user advocate. You are fighting for your users like Tron. <laughs> and so you want to communicate that often. The next one is communicating user value to business impact when you're prioritizing. I'm going to show you what I mean by that when we go through the empathy in action. I'm going to give you sort of a, a roadmap or a path to how you do that. So let's move into empathy in action. Empathy in action to me is I have listened, I have heard, I understand you. Um, I understand why you need these things. Now, how do I decide which of those things to act on? And how do I make sure that we actually get some of the user needs onto the roadmap? when I have all of these different competing priorities. So I want to start with by saying that enterprise products have a lot of stakeholders. Um, if you're already an enterprise product manager, you're chuckling right now because you know that. Um, but you have your users, you have buyers, you have internal stakeholders that range from senior leaders to product leadership to, you know, engineering has tech debt and IT needs us to run some updates and DevOps has these other things. And there's a lot of competing priorities and there's only so much room on the roadmap. And again, don't call your engineers resources. <laughs> and so when you're looking at, well, how do I prioritize all this user feedback I got? When you don't, when you do all this stuff, like I am listening, we're listening. And then you get to a point eventually where your users are like, but I feel like you're not because I still don't have that thing. You still haven't solved this problem for me. And I just saw that you pushed out like nine new features. So where's my stuff, <laughs> right? We have to be really careful about that <clears throat> because um, eventually we lose their trust and they just stop talking and then we lose our ability to innovate. So we have to be really careful with that. So how does that work? Well, <clears throat> I'm stealing the slide from a previous webinar I did called B2B Enterprise Product Leadership. Actually, I sold the last one too. Um, this one just is in general, if, if you're new to product management, there's a lot of things you have to look at besides how do you put yourself in someone else's shoes? Because if they're reporting a problem or a pain point, you need to know how many of those personas are impacted or what work streams are impacted. Do they have a workaround? Does it have to be solved? Or is it a nice to have? Are they just dreaming one day when they submitted that? So I'm by no means saying you don't have to do these anymore. You do. But when we're looking at empathy in action, when we're trying to prioritize our user needs with empathy, it looks a little something like this, like how we go from empathy to on the roadmap. So let's do our university edition. So I have an advisor, a student, and I have faculty. Our advisor, I mean, so if you've been to, to college or university, your advisor helps you with your classes. They help you pick your degrees. They'll help you with all sorts of things. You as a student, you need help navigating the university. How do I sign up for classes? You know, what happens um, if, if I'm failing one, et cetera, et cetera. And then we have faculty. They teach students and they coach them in their coursework. So if we look at, let's say we have these things reported to us or we're noticing these things on campus. So advisors are saying, well, students are dropping into my office all the time, but I'm not available. I'm already booked. I have people in my office. I'm on the phone, whatever that might be. And I feel really bad because I can't help them when they need it. Then you have the student saying, well, I need help. And I go to my advisor, but they're never available. And I have to get registered. And I just don't think I'm doing really well in this class. And then you have faculty that are like, I have office hours and no one comes to see me. <laughs> right. And I can see who's struggling in my class. So we have a theme here. And I'll just pick this theme. You could probably pick other themes. But let's say we want to connect students to help with the university. So we take that theme. And in our next evaluation, we now have to align it to goals. And we're going to align it to their goals. We're going to align it to our goals. And then we're going to develop a problem to solve. Not a solution. A problem to solve. So... The advisor's goal is to retain students and help them be successful. The student wants to graduate. She went from shocked to very happy. <laughs> the student wants to graduate. And then the faculty obviously want to educate and help students pass their class because they want to keep their jobs because they want tenure. <laughs> so they want people to pass their class, right? So we have where this theme comes together, 
everybody kind of has a similar goal, right? We all want the students to graduate. It's just different avenues for that. But we have this underlying theme of needing to connect students to help and the right help. So the university has a goal. Let's say they want to increase retention rates by X percent. And so I can align their, their three complaints or pain points to their goals and our goal with this theme and create a problem to solve that says we need to redu reduce the friction and error for students when they're trying to connect with advisors and faculty for course help, right? So we get a very narrow problem that we can solve. You could leave it more broad, you know, not necessarily course help, could be other things, um, but this is how you align it. And you end up putting that on your roadmap with something like this, where you are tying in the impact and value to your users, to their companies, their business, to your business and your overall product vision. And you align that all together with really empathetic language. And that sounds something like this. When students struggle to connect with help at the university, they are X percent more likely not to return next semester. Not empathetic, just stated fact, we have the data. Empathy, each semester they have several courses with multiple instructors office hours to memorize, several different applications to use depending on the instructor or college, lines to wait in or outside an advisor store, and confusion and figuring out who can help them best. So one of our key business goals is to increase retention rates by X percent by introducing a solution that reduces friction for students and getting help with advisors and fac faculty. We think this is going to help with our retention rates. And you could have some more data in there. And you might even be far enough along where you can say, you know, we believe that the solution is an app, you know, whatever that might be, um, because that aligns with your business vision because you're an app company, let's say. So this is how you bring it all together. When you dig in with empathy, you get this opportunity to really build trust with your users, to really understand them so that you, you're solving the problem because you understand it really, really well. And your team understands it. And when you all come together, you all have a perspective that lends itself to innovating far better. I mean, I think in that article that, that Forbes came out with um, Satya's note about empathy being a driver of innovation, he talks about teams, the most high performing teams are the empathetic ones. And the reason for that is it also helps you better align internally with your team. So the effects of having empathy, the effects of building empathy within your organization and within your team, and the effect of building empathy with your, at least your user group, by inviting them into your space, say in like a sprint review, you build trust. Your users are going to trust that you listen, that you're really going to try to understand them, and you're going to do something about it. Not about everything, but do something about the things that are most important in that align. It's a whole different conversation about how to tell people you understand, but that's not going on the roadmap. <laughs> um, it helps your users build a sense of belonging. They feel heard. They feel connected to you. They, you know, um, I've had such good experiences with the user groups and focus groups and bringing my team into it. I just can't tell you how, it, how well it just unites everyone. And it creates this really transparent, open place where we're all really trying to understand each other, whether it's our users, ourselves, our leadership. It's, it, it's an incredibly useful thing to have on your team. It's going to help you tell a better story. So having a user story like the one that I had early on in our example, I mean, by the time somebody gets to that, product education or change management can see, oh, okay, I can see why we built that. What's the solution so I can document it. Marketing can see why we were trying to solve that thing and what the impact is. And you have a better starting point for a conversation than we added an export. Well, why, how do I communicate that value? I don't understand what that value is, right? So you start from a better foundation. Um, and, and like I said, you know, high performing and innovative teams, better collaboration inside. And then you turn your users into brand champions. You turn your users into product champions. And that word of mouth matters, uh, especially in enterprise products. When people are thinking about making large purchases for their organizations, sometimes products that aren't easy to get out of, it's, you know, it's 
it's not a, a one-way door, but it doesn't feel like a two-way door necessarily that you could easily go in and come back out and change your mind. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed uh, my um, experience with empathy, the things that I've seen work in building empathy with teams. And I've been lucky enough to be on several high-performing, innovative teams with lots of empathy where we really just connect with our users and, and understand where they're coming from and why they need things. And I think it helps a lot with making sure that we're getting the right solutions out there. So I wanna say thank you, thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just look up Kirsten Vandetta, it's also on the first slide and we'll make those available. Thank you so much. <laughs>